Well, thanks everyone for joining us uh, and welcome to the North American University Conference 2021 uh, organized by DocCity. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, we'll give you just a 30 seconds introduction. Well, first of all, uh, Adam. Adam is uh, from Ireland, even though he's based here in Italy with myself. He's our international marketing, marketing manager. And then myself, I am the commercial director here at, uh, at DocCity. So before we, um, we start with our guest speakers, I wanted to give you just a very brief introduction to who DocCity is. DocCity is an international student community. We're based out of Italy, but we're present in over 70 different countries. We have over 20 million students today connected with us. We started the company back in 2011 in Turin, Italy, where I am currently based, uh, and we're now the largest student community in the world. Um, we help students on two different levels. The first one is guide them through their studies, and the second one is help them find future educational choices. So future degrees, but undergraduate program, postgraduate programs, executive programs, language courses, any type of degree they might be looking for. So that's just uh, the brief introduction about DOCSIS. So Adam, now I'll leave it to you to introduce the agenda of the day. Thank you, Andrea. So folks, the plan today is to do a very simple one hour event with lots of great content in just 60 minutes. Um, we'll first have our opening remarks uh, section with uh, Jing. He's the president of the American International Recruitment Council and also provost of international affairs of the San Mateo Colleges of Silicon Valley. Then we will have Lynn, and Lynn is president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Then we'll have Jason, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Institute of International Education. And we'll have Roger, who is Chair of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, and he's also President of McDaniel College. Then we have Merrill, who is the Senior Vice President of Content Strategy and De Development of the Association of Governing, Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. And then we'll have Bodo, and Bodo has three positions. She's Chair of the Association of MBAs, otherwise known as AMBA. Uh, he's Chair of the Business Graduate Association, BGA, and he's also Professor and Chair of the Institute for International Marketing at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Then we will have a keynote speech from George. And um, George is a, a global higher education strategy and digital, digitalization expert. And then we will have a rapid fire talk section with Alec Knight from Colorado Mesa University, uh, Catherine from Canada College. We'll have Dylan from the Gabelli School of Business of Fordham University. And then we'll have Kais who is from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And then we'll have an audience Q&A where you folks can type in the chat uh, whatever questions you have uh, for us and for the panel. Hello, everyone. And my name is Jing Luan. I'm the Provost of uh, International Education of Silic San Mateo College of Silicon Valley, as Adam introduced, and also President of ARC, American International Recruitment Council which is the only organization authorized by the U.S. Department of Justice and U.S. Commerce Department to issue standards for pra and practices uh, for international recruitment. Uh, I am truly thankful for Doc City to put together this conference. I am very impressed by the reach of uh, Doc City and terribly, terribly honored to join the distinguished colleagues on the panel. Uh, very quickly about my colleges and what I'm trying to say is our three colleges are ranked number one in the US for safety, transfer to top universities, number of American universities uh, who, are, who legally provide uh, guaranteed transfer admissions to our students. And recently, uh, our colleges received the highest honor issued by the US government, the JFK Presidential Award of Excellence for our work in international expansion and trade. We are among the first to provide global online learning. As a matter of fact, we started in 2018 uh, to a student uh, for them to receive course credits. So when they are admitted to a university, they don't need to take the course again, ever. And this way they save money and they save a lot of time. Uh, this is really truly the beauty of the American system of, uh, we call it academic credit system of America. Uh, that allows you to earn course credits from an accredited college like ours 
and then take the credits with you to any university uh, where you want to eventually to earn a bachelor's degree. So that's one concept I wanted to tell you about, uh, which is the uh, academic credit system. Uh, these universities I mentioned uh, 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 just a moment ago include UC Berkeley, UCLA, SUNY, Stony Brook, Wesleyan College, and on and on, a total of 150 of them and, and counting. They belong to an organization established by my colleges in, in collaboration with UC Berkeley and Stanford. It is called College University Partnership, CUP. What CUP does uh, is to join force with uh, 150 universities to convince the entire world that there are two ways to receive a bachelor's degree in America. Uh, university Freshman Admissions, UFA, and University Transfer Admissions, UTA. Most of you, uh, if, you, if you have students or in the audience, most of the students will know, I'm very familiar with UFA, since uh, the students have been preparing for the applications into universities as a freshman. It's a tradition, obviously, but if you know, 40% of American students uh, baccalaureate degree student seekers don't necessarily apply directly to a university. They come to a college like mine to do university transfer missions, UTA. Uh, you may have heard the acronyms or phrases like two plus two, one plus one plus two, three plus one, pathways of, you name it. Uh, these are very much all part of UTA. Recall that I mentioned that I am the president of uh, American International Recruitment Council. Uh, ARC is responsible for the standards with which agencies, schools, universities, and various student recruitment and enrollment organizations use. For those who want to go through the rigorous standards certification, they, come, they become certified agencies of ARC, uh, which instantly gives them the credibility or license for them to recruit students to US schools and colleges. So that's my three minutes talk to, for you to remember four names, uh, and then what the who, uh, and then you know what they do. Again, the our American Academic Credit System, College University Partnership, UFA and UTA, and of course uh, ARC. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, Jing. Right on time. I love it. Um, so, Lynn, it's uh, your turn now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Adam. It is such an honor and privilege to be with you and offer greetings on behalf of the association of American colleges and universities. Now, the events of the past year, a global pandemic and suing economic crisis, the emergence of this moment of racial reckoning, burgeoning political polarization and partisanship culminating in the attack on the US Capitol and a surge of xenophobic violence have led to a renewed sense of urgency around fulfilling AACNU's mission of advancing the vitality and public standing of liberal education by making quality and equity the foundations for excellence in undergraduate education and service to democracy. Indeed, we're convinced that our nation's historic mission of educating for democracy is inextricably linked to a liberal education and international student recruitment is at the center of AACNU's vision of a 21st century liberal education that will prepare students for success in work, citizenship, and life. If those of us in higher education <clears throat> have learned anything from COVID-19, it's that the challenges we're facing as a global community now are emblematic of the types of unscripted complex problems students will be forced to grapple with in the future. Resolving them will require diverse teams offering multiple perspectives and the capacity to speak across differences. And despite policy changes that created barriers to international recruitment and enrollment, colleges and universities across the country have remained steadfast in their commitment to international students as essential to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Through active involvement with diverse communities and real world challenges, institutions of all types and at all levels must prepare students by cultivating personal and social responsibility involving civic knowledge and engagement at the local and global levels, intercultural knowledge and competence, and ethical reasoning and action. Indeed, liberal education today, whether in business or the health professions, residential or community colleges or research universities, it takes place through 
a process of encounter. And these encounters are immeasurably enriched when they are characterized by a diversity of backgrounds, identities, and outlooks among students, faculty, and community partners, foregrounding and developing a global perspective that situates civic engagement and community involvement. I wanna thank you for all that you're doing to strengthen higher education through your deep and abiding commitment to internationalizing the academy at a time when it is essential not only to our democracies, uh, to our economies, but to democracy itself. Thank you so very much. And uh, now Jason um, from the uh, IIE, it's uh, your turn to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to Doc City for organizing this event and for the panelists and all the participants. When I think back to about a year ago uh, at, at IIE, our first priority uh, was to help our grantees uh, return to their home countries if they wanted to. Um, and this was a, a major uh, change for us. IIE was founded in 1919 for the purpose of fostering international exchange and people to people exchanges. As soon as we were largely done with that emergency situation, though, we had to pivot to uh, doing our activities virtually. And um, that included uh, recruitment for uh, the, the scholarships that we uh, implement for our sponsors, as well as for the universities that we assist with their outreach efforts. And we learned a few things. One is that with the uh, going virtual, that we're able to reach a much larger audience than, than we would with person to person. Um, in most cases, uh, in some countries where internet is, is not quite as uh, strong or bandwidth issues, of course, it has made it more difficult. Um, but uh, that, that was a big part of our recruitment. Likewise, we have been successful at actually doing exchanges during this pandemic. It's a lot more difficult, um, but we've been able to do this, but we've also moved some of our activities and some of uh, things like pre-departure orientations to online, as well as selection panels to online. And I expect that due to the cost savings and the efficiencies of this, that that will continue, that we will have a hybrid approach. But at IIE, we are still, uh, our focus is on people to people exchanges, and we expect that to bounce back. In our entire history, it has always bounced back. And we've done a few things to encourage that. One is last year we gave uh, a total of $2 million in emergency grants to international students suffering from uh, financial hardship uh, in the United States. And then earlier this week, we announced a program to uh, assist uh, universities and colleges and assist their students with uh, obtaining US passports. And we're hoping to hit 10,000 passports and encourage people to do that. So we see this, the future as being hybrid, that you cannot discount the importance of person-to-person -person exchanges, but there are ways to create efficiencies, to use uh, sponsor funds in a greater uh, way uh, efficiently and have uh, even more effective and better outreach in many cases. Uh, so again, thank you, Doc City, and uh, look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, Jason, I uh, appreciate that. Um, so next up, we have Roger uh, from Naiku. Thank you very much, Adam, and thank you so much, Doxity, for putting on today's event. And my thanks to all of you who were involved in education globally for joining us. Uh, I'm Roger Casey. I'm the president of McDaniel College uh, in Maryland, a college of about 3,000, but we also have an international campus in Budapest, Hungary. So like many of you, I understand that we are now saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, across the planet. Uh, but today I'm speaking to you primarily in my role as chairman of the board of NICU, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. Since 1976, NICU has represented nearly 1,000 uh, institutions of higher learning across America. We are an extraordinarily diverse organization. Uh, all of our colleges are private, which means they are not publicly funded by states or the federal government, and they are nonprofit uh, institutions. Uh, we are private colleges, but we believe very much that we have a public purpose. 
uh, and our public purpose has predominantly been focused on providing uh, and advocating for access for students in not only the United States, but globally. So we focus very much on financial aid. We've also been very much focused uh, the past four years with the previous administration on international student access and our concerns about access for those students in the United States. I'm very pleased to say, especially after recent conversations with the Biden administration, that many of the actions that were taken by the administration the past four years are being overturned so that we try to create a more welcoming and inclusive climate for students, regardless of where they come from. If you want to learn more about our schools, I strongly encourage you to go to a website and that website is you can, and that is the letter U-C-A-N, which stands for University and College Accountability Network, ucan-network.org. And on that site, all of our institutions post interesting information and comparable data about those schools. Uh, and I think one of the things you will find about private institutions in America, they are affordable, they are diverse, they are focused on lessening the debt burden of students when they graduate, whether undergraduate or graduate school, and they are very innovative. Our schools, as I said, are extraordinarily diverse. Some of them are master's and doctoral level research universities. There are religious colleges, historically black colleges and universities, art schools, women's colleges, two-year colleges, medical schools, law schools, but a large portion of our institutions in Naiku, like my own college, McDaniel, are liberal arts colleges, smaller schools focusing on the residential experience of students and particularly interested in diversifying those residential students with international students. Uh, on my own campus, we have students from 40 different countries represented in our student body. And we believe that richness helps to create the kind of liberal education that Lynn was describing earlier. Uh, I want to once again thank all of you for the work that you do, particularly in the climate that we're in now uh, globally with COVID, to try to create the greatest opportunities and the greatest access for the students you represent. And we hope that our NICU institutions and the ucan-network.org can be helpful to you in that enterprise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger. And in chats, I've just shared that website. And uh, I see we've just reached 200 participants as well, which is excellent. So um, we're ending on a good note uh, with your talk. And now next we have uh, Meryl from the AGB. Hi, thank you. I'm pleased to be with, with you today. And I'd like to uh, do a shout out to Roger Casey, who just spoke. Uh, he's at, as president of, of McDaniel College uh, he and the board were uh, recipients of an award in 2020 from AGB for Outstanding Board Service. So thank you, Roger, for all that you do. And thank you to your uh, board chair, Otto uh, Grunther, who serves on our council of, of board chairs. Uh, I'll say a little bit about AGB. We're uh, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. So our members are the members of boards of trustees of colleges and universities, public, private, uh, and foundations, the institutionally related foundations of public universities. We have over 1,300 governing boards as members and 2,000 2, colleges and universities which they govern. I'd like to make three points today. Uh, one, American colleges and universities provide great opportunities. Two, the barriers presented by the pandemic and the Trump administration are lifting. And three, online education is a more viable option and expands opportunities for many more students. So first, uh, the US is home to many world-class universities, but offers also a great range of institutional types and programs. We provide choices for international students that they may not have at home. And the US has excess capacity. Uh, it's regional, uh, not every state, uh, but it's a great destination for international students this fall and in coming years. Uh, two, 
The pandemic and the Trump administration regulations have had a huge negative impact on international student enrollment. We're well aware of it. According to the Council of Graduate Schools, the number of new graduate students in the US fell by 40% in the fall of 2020. This will change due to two developments, vaccines for COVID-19, yay, and the changes in federal policies under the Biden administration, which will ease travel restrictions, processing of visas, uh, optional practical training, and immigration. Couple this with the racial equity commitments of colleges and universities, and I think campuses will be more welcoming and offer a sense of belonging and inclusion. Uh, AGB has offered its own diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative and is working with our our member boards to advance the goals of just, equitable, and inclusive campuses. Third, online education has expanded as never anticipated. We went online in a matter of weeks and did more to provide online education than we ever thought possible. Uh, it's likely to remain a bigger segment of American higher education in the future. Um, our boards, uh, for instance, are in meeting virtually and having better experiences than we ever thought before. Uh, we don't think this is going away after the pandemic ends. Uh, pan the platforms, too, for online education are better than they have ever been before. Faculty are more experienced and uh, they're providing a more interactive experience than ever before. Um, we do think that fall will be more normal than it has this year in terms of online, in terms of on-campus education, and we welcome and want students to, to come to the U.S., but we think that this um, expanded online opportunity provides uh, many more opportunities for, for international students. So thank you very much. Meryl, thank you. Uh, a lot of information in just two or three minutes, uh, very useful. And last but not least, um, Bodo. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to uh, welcome you from uh, Vienna, Austria. So it's a good evening from me. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, I would like to use my allocated two minutes or, or maybe it was two hours. I'm not quite sure with the Italians, you never know. Uh, I think it's two minutes um, to, to tell you about three things, who we are, what we do and why I think business education in particular needs some radical innovation. So let's start with number one, who we are. Um, I'm representing here the Association of MBAs, uh, AMBA for short. It's one of the three global accreditation agencies, um, the other two being EFMD uh, and AACSB. Obviously, AACSB is particularly well known in the United States. Second point, uh, what do we do? Uh, we are organized as a charity and uh, our activities fall into three areas. Our AMBA brand accredits some 280 business schools and their MBA programs in some 75 countries. Uh, about 100 of these schools we accredit hold the so-called triple crown accreditation. That is to say they are accredited by AMBA, AACSB and EFMD specifically through their Equus accreditation. Um, second, the Business Credit Association is our other brand, and here we focus not on program accreditation, but on school accreditation. The key here is, the key uh, uh, accreditation criteria uh, are the commitments to sustainability, lifelong learning, and entrepreneurship. And the third area of our focus is capacity building, capacity building of faculty uh, in our business schools, uh, as well as our students and graduate members. And we do this via conferences, webinars, uh, newsletters, etc. So I tend to spend quite a lot of time on, on Zoom. And if you see the eyes getting very square, that's presumably an effect of my Zooming. Now, last point, why do we need, why I think we need radical uh, business school innovation? Um, that could fill basically an evening, but I would like to confine myself to four key reasons. First of all, our competitive environment is changing rapidly and has already changed rapidly. Now business schools uh, compete with the likes of Coursera, LinkedIn, corporate universities and consulting companies. 
Second point, the dominance of the U.S. business school, and I apologize for this, is eroding uh, from uh, many points of view. Um, U.S. schools now face substantially stronger international competition. Think about very leading Chinese schools, for example, which are very often off the radar in the United States. Uh, third point, the technological environment is changing. So uh, our online teaching, which already was mentioned by some other speakers, um, have largely freed our competition from geographical boundaries. So it has opened new avenues, which we never experienced before. And the last point is that student concerns is also changing. I'm particularly talking about business students, but here business students are now interested in what I call profit plus, the plus being more sustainability and more CSR issues in addition to the profit issues. So that's about it for the who, what, and why. Um, I don't have more time, even counting some Italian inflation into the equation. So if you would like to have more information, um, the, the name Bodo Schlegelmilch can be easily found uh, on Google or LinkedIn with such a strange and, and a long name. Uh, absolutely no problem. So as long as you work out how to spell it, uh, you find my, uh, my um, contacts. Please feel to email. Um, I will also put a, on the chat a, a, link, uh, a, a link to an article which is in fact entitled Why Business Schools Need Radical Innovation. Um, and uh, some of you may in fact find this uh, in, uh, of interest. Thank you very much again for the invitation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, so Bodo, Jing, Lynn, Jason, Roger, Merrill, thank you so much. That was a great opening to the event. Um, now we have George T. Sipos. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, George is a global higher education strategy and digitalization expert. And George is going to speak about the future of digital higher education and how virtual events and virtual marketing can help universities, colleges and business schools recruit international students. Let me start with the beginning. I guess the beginning is is with a brief uh, introduction of myself. So I am I'm 25 years of experience in higher education, mostly strategy, international higher education. Um, but I'm also a Japan specialist. Um, um, yeah, I, I spent nine years in, in higher education in Japan as well as in the United States. Um, I uh, when I teach, I teach mostly Japanese language and, and literature. I know it doesn't quite fit, but but they kind of go together in a in a larger sort of uh, scheme of things. Um, I spent time in corporate Japan in Toyota Motor Corporation, uh, working on corporate value creation as well as corporate philosophy and corporate strategy, and in Japan at universities such as Osaka, uh, the International College of Liberal Arts in the United States at Chicago, uh, in the SUNY system at Brockport, and in St. Louis at Missouri. Um, and I hold a doctorate in East Asian Languages and Civilization from the University of Chicago. Um, uh, by the way, as you can tell by my accent, I'm also an European. I, I, I come from Eastern Europe. I'm originally Hungarian, Romanian uh, from Transylvania. Yes, it does exist. Uh, that's, uh, that's my that's my shtick about Transylvania, right? Uh, people say, well, really, is that a real place? Yeah, it is, <laughs> for better or for worse, right? So um, I want to begin uh, very quickly. We don't have a lot of time. So I'd like to begin with this. Um, uh, I, I found this statement uh, from uh, Christensen and uh, Iring's uh, book. Uh, maybe about five, six years ago, I was fascinated by it. Um, uh, and uh, then the book, of course, is, is a classic, The Innovation University, or the, the Innovative University, published in 2011. Um, this is uh, 2011, as you may remember, is, is a time of change in, in, in a higher education. Um, uh, Stanford launches the MOOCs. And, uh, and that's when um, um, uh, uh, Christensen applies for the first time his idea of like disruptive innovation or disruption of innovation. Um, Christensen, of course, was a business uh, scholar uh, from the Harvard School of Business. Um, he applies that, that idea to universities and he's, saying, he's realizing at that time that change is inevitable. It, it will happen. It doesn't matter when and how it will happen. And for the longest time, by the way, Christensen passed away, uh, uh, I think last year, early last year, uh, but for the last, uh, until the last interview he had in 2019, he kept saying, this is going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to, he didn't quite catch the pandemic to see that what triggered it was actually that unfortunate event that he mentions in this, uh, in this, in this quote, which is uh, a, an external 
uh, an external factor because higher education um, uh, institutions, uh, again, for better or for worse, have tended to be uh, conservative, have tended to, to, to hold on to, to the degrees, to the way they teach, to the structures that they've, uh, they've created. So um, uh, that change that he predicted back in 2011 took a while to happen. It is happening now, not at the level or with the intensity that he was hoping back in, in 2011, but it is uh, happening. And part of that is what we call, um, or what I call today, comprehensive digitalization. Um, we know about the crisis of higher education, especially in the United States, but there are different types of crises around the world. I mean, uh, for somebody who's looking strategically at a, a, a worldwide uh, sort of um, a tableau of landscape of higher education, you see how in pockets, uh, uh, you know, European education is suffering, European higher education is suffering in its own way, uh, American education, uh, South American education, Asian education, and so on. Um, on the, on, on this, on this side, on our side of the ocean, uh, we're looking at a prohibitive cost of running the universities. The universities have grown outside of what they can actually, what, what their capacity can be. Uh, the structures are also fine. There is a lot of um, uh, reliance on, on structures that students in the generations, uh, even in the Y, but the Gen Z for, for sure, uh, do not quite connect with. They, quite, they can't quite see it. Um, and, it, and for that, the, there's fissures, there's ruptures that, that in, in, the, in, the, in the cognitive uh, uh, processes that students have when they, when they join the university where uh, they expect, and as a, as a practitioner, of course, as many of my esteemed colleagues in the panel, um, and having been in, in higher education um, institutions in Japan and, and the United States uh, for many years, I see how students get confused over time, you know, interacting with students as, a, as an international student advisor and then at, at admissions and recruitment, uh, you see how they get confused about, uh, you know, um, anything from like the structure of the student counseling to, to tuition uh, levels and changes um, uh, on the credits that cost more than it's advertised. And it's, you know, so there's different, there's different things that, that I think we needed to address. And this, this uh, uh, crisis has been going on for a long time. There is increased global competition and, and uh, Bodo talked uh, uh, earlier about the new MBAs or the MBAs that are coming strong from behind and they're, they're competing against the United States uh, MBAs. And I think that is absolutely uh, phenomenal that this is, this is happening. We need more competition uh, out there. Um, the ongoing e-learning evolution is, of course, the, the MOOCs that started in, by Stanford in 2011 and so on. But the, what's the most important part for me, and this is where I think digitalization and hybridization, of course, we're not talking about uh, uh, creating a, a streamlined digital, digitalized process for students to just do school online um, uh, constantly. Recently, we're talking mostly about the hybrid process here. Um, uh, you know, it is the global access, the open global access. And we've seen this over the past year, actually. Uh, while we're talking about numbers of international student enrollments dropping uh, at undergrad level, at graduate level, we see universities that are, um, in fact, reporting um, higher numbers of, of enrollment. We'll talk about them uh, in a little bit. So we have to look at, at what is attractive in this new environment for students uh, when it comes to uh, to digital learning. So <clears throat> let's move forward um, and, and look at the silver lining of this pandemic uh, crisis, right? Um, we had to, the COVID-19 has helped us uh, reckon sort of with, with our outdated models. And, and I think it's important to recognize what is good, what's bad and what's ugly. And in the in the higher education, uh, especially in the United States, but also in the UK and Western Europe um, and see what can be changed what needs to stay, if anything? And then how do we transform that whole paradigm of higher education so that it responds to an increasingly, um, uh, uh, an increasingly detached uh, sort of workforce that we're having a trouble keeping up with, that we're not able, I mean, we, we used to say in 2018, 2019, in, in, in higher education in the United States, we used to say, we don't even know what the jobs of the 20 years from now or 15 years from now are going to be. Who's going to choose our students? How are they going to, where are they going to go? And so on. So we lost that contact in a way with what was happening in the world. That doesn't mean that we don't have to teach certain uh, certain areas. I'm a humanities person. I don't believe that we need to eliminate humanities from, from higher education. That that would be a, 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 a terrible uh, a terrible loss for the education of younger generations. Um, on the other hand, what we've seen is that providing degrees online alone is not sufficient. It doesn't do the job. 
putting an LMS out there, putting Blackboard out there, putting a, a Google, a, 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 whatever, a, a, a classroom and so on out there and teaching through that is not going to be sufficient. I teach language and literature. I mean, it's terrible, you know, I don't know how it works with business. I've never taught business. But when you teach language and you try to teach 70 students, 80 students, 100 students through a, a digital platform like we have right now, like Classroom, it doesn't work. I mean, I, I can't hear the students. I can't see to, uh, to my colleagues' uh, point. I can see their reactions. I can see their faces. I want to see them open their mouth as they say things in Japanese. It doesn't, I can't see it. You know, plus they don't want to turn on their cameras. I don't blame them for that. I mean, why would they, especially for some students who uh, just simply don't want to know where, where they live and how they live. And that's their right. So, uh, so uh, we need to change that. We need to do more. What can we do? Uh, as I said, we've seen, though, however, tremendous growth in enrollment over the past uh, over the past year. I mean, I was sitting in a, in a webinar. By the way, are, are you feeling that fatigue of like webinars? I've been I've been sitting in about I don't know forty webinars since uh, January fifteen. It's like tremendous what's happening. Everybody's trying to put ideas out there. The, the the future of higher education is out there. Everybody wants to know how it's happening, where it's happening. PHE is out there, and Pi, and everyone is trying to to get voices out. Um, I'm feeling that fatigue, but I think it's a good fatigue. I think we're we're actually participating. This is exciting. This is an exciting moment for me in higher education because we're now at the point where we're like, okay, we're talking about this. We are talking about higher education. We're talking about how things are going to change. We are talking about how international education will change, international recruitment will change. So I was sitting in a webinar. Um, um, I can't remember who organized it, somebody. Uh, and uh, and uh, people from NYU and from Penn State and, you know, big brand schools in the U.S. are saying, wow, tremendous impact, tremendous uh, growth in enrollment, in applications and all that. We see 28% growth at such and such university. I'm not going to give names. And 33% at such. A, well, <clears throat> why is that? I mean, I always have to ask the step backwards and to sort of look at what they're presenting and say, why, why is that happening? Well, it's happening in many cases. And oh, and what they were saying too um, was so many other markets. We've never seen these markets before. Hmm. Why could that be? Well, it is because there is a promise for digital education. First of all, when, when you apply to NYU, what you're thinking is New York City. Oh my goodness. How am I going to live in New York City? You know, it's going to cost you double the tuition, if not more. If it's only the tuition, maybe you can deal with it. But if it's so much more, can you ever afford to live, to rent an apartment, to whatever? I mean, that, I think, is opening the door. But that works for the big brand, big brand university, right? What do we do with the other schools? What does that mean for us? These are things that we have to reckon with. We have to sit and think about what are the... The, the small, uh, the, the mid-sized universities around the world going to do with this new, with this new uh, movement. However, um, we do see drops, right, in enrollment. I mean, we, I think um, um, uh, somebody mentioned earlier um, in the panel <clears throat> a drop in undergrad for fall 2020, right? The, I, I, think, I think it was Jason, right? IIE has reported 43% drop the fall 2020 in the United States. We've seen, we've seen a drop in graduate. It just got published yesterday from the Council of Graduate Schools, a 39% uh, uh, drop, drop in enrollment for international students in grad school, first time international students in grad school. 43% of those are in master's programs. Master's programs used to be the bread and butter of a lot of schools. It's not happening anymore. It's dropping. Right. So there is consistent drop in the United States. On the other hand, by the way, do you know what the dirty secret is? Just this morning, there was another announcement that there is an increase in the number of undergrad applications of U.S. students to the U.K. Ta -da. I mean, I've been wondering for the longest time when you have to pay so much to be in, a, in one of our schools in the United States. Why don't you go to Japan? I used to work, establish the first office of, of international admissions at Osaka University. Do you know the tuition at Osaka University is like, I think it was $5,300, so $5,300 uh, 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 per semester. No, per year, I'm sorry. And it's tremendous when you compare it with like a 15, 20, 25, $30,000 at a public school in the United States. I'm not talking Columbia. I'm not talking Harvard. So there is a discrepancy here. What if our students actually, even the domestic students, start moving out? 
what if they catch on to that? You know, uh, th these are things that that I think we, we should give us uh, should give us uh, pause in my mind at least. Because what I care about in higher education is what the student experience is and what the student gets out of it. You know, um, in my mind, what the uh, uh, better digitization, better integration of our digital services can do for the student is to give more access. And yes, I know some of them don't have good access to the internet and some of them don't have enough money to pay the tuition, but at least it's a step forward. More students feel now compelled to at least try to get into a better school. Uh, to get into a school internationally uh, that they couldn't even consider before because they couldn't pay for the living expenses, right? So <clears throat> this is this is what I think the silver lining is, and it's a, it's a back and forth, right? There's pluses and minuses. I mean, we know that undergrad enrollments in the United States for years have been on a negative growth. I mean, looking at the numbers, yeah, they were going up, but the year year to year growth was negative. That's a trend that started in 2016. It's not new. We all know that, right? So what's the digital university? What do I understand by, uh, by this? And I think that different colleagues in, in the field, especially consultants and, and, and specialists in digitization are talking now about you know, university 4.0, aligning it with industry 4.0 and so on and so forth, preparing the students who are able to come out of a digital environment of learning to go into a digital environment of, of workforce and so on and so forth. So what I'm looking at from my perspective is first and foremost, the student experience, like I said, you know, it's your uh, marketing, your, your website, your social media, it's your recruitment and admissions process, it's the way in which you provide student management and support. Um, uh, learning management systems, of course, LMS um, uh, that we already have. Uh, what do we do about the experiential learning management? How many of the software that we've been using over the past year um, are actually truly providing a, a good experience? I mean. You know, I remember in back in March last year or in April last year, everybody was laughing. So how are you going to learn to dissect, uh, uh, dissect a frog uh, on the camera, of course? Uh, yes, those aspects still remain. There are ways in which the experiential learning can happen. Library access, of course, has been happening for a long time. International education. How do we do international education? I mean, we've seen companies pivot very fast and provide study abroad um, uh, internships uh, digitally, virtually. Is it the same impact? I don't know. I'm, I come from the international education. Um, I don't believe that that there is uh, uh, the same impact when it comes to doing things virtually. You have to be there. You have to 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 use your sensory, uh, you know, your senses to experience uh, 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 the new place that you're in. To talk with the people. To to engage with them. Um, alumni management and development is happening more and more. The CRM system, thank God, can can take a student throughout this entire this entire experience and so on. Fundraising. So I'm looking at this whole experience. How the pieces exist? They're there, right? How do they connect? How do they go together? Do they integrate with one another so that the student benefits uh, benefits from that? Um, I don't want to uh, spend uh, way too much time, but I'm looking at the digital portfolio for your for your international recruitment. And these are things that have existed there in international uh, recruitment for a long time, right? The website. How many times have you heard in your admissions office and recruitment office? Do you all, well, the website is the best tool in your in your in your toolbox, right? Uh, for for attracting uh, students. And you know there are universities that took. 10, 15 years to, to, to introduce a more interactive website, uh, you know, to, to allow departments even to, um, uh, to intervene on the websites. I mean, I know how, how many approvals I had to get at universities I used to work at to get like one more change on the website, you know, because it wasn't CMS, it was HTML. So then by the time you get content management systems, it, it's all complicated, right? We can't have it complicated. This has to be a tool that, that interacts with us. The AI chatbots, you know, they're still at the beginning. They're still here and there. You see them, though. They, they exist. They're starting. They're primitive. You know, they kind of they kind of remind me of that uh, of that joke. I don't know if you if you watch uh, uh, animation shows as a Japan specialist. I'm a big fan of animation. You know, so uh, so uh, in, in, when they're talking about the robot, robot, this history of robots or something, they're imagining uh, in one show, they're imagining robots like in, as cavemen, you know. Uh, but that's kind of where I think chatbots are now. They're like kind of like doing um, 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 ancient uh, ancient human tasks, but they'll get there. They will be closer and closer to being able. AI will develop. And I'm a firm believer in the, in the need for AI in interactions, 
uh, virtual campus tours, I'll show you a, a couple of examples. I think that those are so important because they engage the student, uh, the applicant, your applicants in a different way. Uh, portal presence for lead generation, we all know this. We kind of did it, hot courses used to be out there. It's now been bought out to a different company. Um, you know, they're gone, but other companies are out there. There's a lot of that happening. Social media content. This is where we suffer a lot. Universities suffer a lot when it comes to social media content. Either we don't know how to create it, we don't know how to address the students around, or we're not allowed to because the whatever marketing division, whatever marketing group owns that. So you can't touch it, right? This is a major issue because in order to be relevant as you're creating social media, you want to generate it constantly. You know, I mean, in, in past position, I used to give access to like five, 10, 15 students to just do it themselves. Just go ahead and do it. It's on you, you create it and so on and so forth. Digital fairs and webinars, of course, part of that. The automated communications. I mean, we all know about the CRM, but how do we just go past that and individualize, personalize, customize that experience? I mean, nobody wants to get like a bunch of emails that just say, dear applicant, dear student, you know, even even that that little trick where like it automatically replace your first name with like they put it in there. It's still, I mean, anybody's going to tell you that that's an automatized thing. How much can we personalize that? What is the next stage of this? Customized communications, messaging, testing, calling, uh, WhatsApping, uh, WeChatting, and so on and so forth. Every all of these names have become verbs now, right? How much of that do we do? You have to do it consistent, and you have to have people to do it or use chatbots for it. So let's look at a couple of examples real, real quick. Um, I want to show you some of my favorite websites uh, today. And they change, by the way. They change constantly. I believe in interactivity in, in, uh, in websites. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to try to get out of here and move you into the um, brown. Um, right? Let's look at brown. Can, can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Good, good. So... So look at this, I'm, I'm a firm believer in this type of interactive uh, screen. And you will say, well, but what happens with like slow uh, internet speeds and stuff? Actually, I did research on Brown and John Hopkins, so I'm going to show you in a second. They use uh, frames at a slower rate and they use a background that allows for faster movement regardless of the speed of the internet that you have. So you get the same experience regardless of where you are. Of course, I assume not a lot of people are still on dial up, but, but uh, this, this type of experience uh, is, is built with um, uh, taking a, a very little of your, of your speed. Uh, same, thi same thing with, um, with John, uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, I mean, this is, this is good. This attracts, this draws attention of the students. The student wants to see at least the image and they want to, uh, to spend more time in, uh, in here. This is, this is the campus, right? I mean, this is the type of, of tool that you want on your side when it comes to, to, to websites. Uh, you want the ability, look how greatly they did this. This is new, people with masks, students with masks, with the social distancing and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back to, um, oh yes, the virtual campus tours. I want to show you that as well. Um, so on Campus 360, I think that um, we have some, um, um, See if I'm able to move away from here. Yes, so Campus 360, right? This is a new virtual tour tool that's coming out there and some universities have signed up with it and they created um, a really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, tours. They, um, I, I spoke with them the other day and they said, look, the next step in this is that we will have guides, either AI chatbots, that will guide the student through the virtual tour, or even when they're available, students whose image will show up there, who, who will actually be talking like me right now, and then uh, also guide the students through the virtual tour. Let's look at, at uh, Binghamton, right? Um, um, and um, trying to get this to move now. Well, I think I'm going to allow you to, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Right, so, so what this does, of course, creates a virtual tour type of experience, right? Uh, it's Campus 360, right, as it, as, it, uh, as it says, and there's your quad, right? And you move through the quad and you go into 
you know, different places of the quad. I mean, it's not sci-fi. This is happening now. This is this is an exciting development. You go into the marketplace, I guess, the store on campus, right? And you see what's happening in the store. I mean, um, the, the, the cafeteria, um, university underground, right? This is the type of experience that students want to see virtually, that want to experience. Um, so... <clears throat> I think that this is the type of uh, this is the type of thing that will uh, help us move forward in the digital recruitment of students. The CRM, of course, especially for international recruitment students, we've tested a number of them over the years. We know uh, HubSpot, we know Salesforce. Of course, Salesforce has been adaptable and flexible, able. Um, Microsoft Dynamics um, 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 is the the tool from Microsoft. They keep coming up. There will be more and more. And I think that what we need to know right now is as we're looking at this comprehensive digitalization is how many of these are able to like integrate to one another. You want them to connect. You want to be able to take that lead from the portal, from wherever it is, capture it and put it through the CRM. So the chatbots, of course, like I said, they're like of um, uh, big beginner level, right? But they're there. Last year, they did the job with a lot of universities. I mean, I've seen them with Georgia Tech, we've, we've seen them with um, uh, Saginaw Valley State, you know, there are some um, uh, manufacturers there of chatbots that, that are happening, you know. The chatbot will, will turn out, will turn to be a, a very important tool when we switch from that website presence that's mostly visible and, and uh, very impactful on a screen, the apps. The apps are probably the next level in the interaction between the student and the um, and the university, and that's when the chatbot will become a very important piece of uh, of that. And of course, AI learns slowly, but once they learn, they know how to do it, and they know how to direct that. Um, you see a piece from the New York Times. Um, you know, uh, chatbots cut to the to the to the clutter. Um, uh, somebody uh, somebody says, I don't want to to go uh, over my time too too badly. Um, um, there's questions I think that Adam will. Um, we'll uh, curate uh, in a little bit. If there's any questions directly for me, you can always find me at my email address. I'm happy to help. Um, I go through tons of software, tons of portals, tons of uh, digital experience uh, things for higher education. As you can tell, it's my passion. Thank you very much. I appreciate Doc City and my colleagues for allowing me to uh, talk about this. Now, for those of you who don't know, who uh, joined us through the, through the event, Doxit is an international student community. So we help students find future degrees. So we have a network of over 20 million students today in 70 different countries. And we're trying to help our students find a potential uh, degree. So that could be a bachelor program, a master program. It could be uh, an executive program and so on. <clears throat> I think there is a... It's, it's interesting uh, what has happened in the past year, because uh, while I agree uh, that online education, it's much harder. Uh, when we look at online recruitment instead, what we have seen has been a massive increase because more students have been home, more students have been connected. And a lot of our students are still looking to study abroad. So that's the interesting thing. So when we look at these two surveys, we look at the one on the left, that in September, 2020, we asked uh, a bit over, 4 million of our students and about 732,000 responded. 76% still told us they're looking to study abroad. So that's, that's, a, that's fantastic. That's really interesting. And it's really great to see, especially when, you know, I'm based in Italy. Italy is on a pretty much on a lockdown like the rest of Europe. Um, we can go to the supermarket, but restaurants are closed and, and, and you know, only kids up to 11 year old can go to school. So seeing that an, a student who's 17, 18, 20, 25, or 30 looking to go and study abroad, that's fantastic. Now, we did the same survey again in February, and what happened is that it increased the number. We thought it was going to decrease because the pandemic kept being here. Countries kept being, on, kept being on lockdown, and they kept not allowing visas, the embassies, because that's another challenge we have, for example, here in Italy. You cannot get a visa. You cannot go to the embassy. It's closed. So still 89% of our students are looking to study abroad. And why are they looking still to study abroad? Really is because of the type of mode, the delivery of the program. If the program is offered online right now, they have a hope to be able to move on campus. Because in the end, what really makes the difference is the experience on the campus, especially for US universities. As an Italian student, 
myself in the past who has studied abroad, we see US universities, Australian universities, international universities as, you know, the student, the experience is the school, you know, we go into the school, uh, the sports that you guys offer, you offer things that they don't, they're not offered here in Europe. Universities in Europe here work very, very differently, at least in Italy or France or Spain than US universities. So students are still looking to travel, are still looking to study abroad. We're helping and working with over 25, almost 30 institutions in the United States right now, helping them attract international students, not only from South America, but also from Europe, from the GCC, from Australia, from Russia, from India. So there are a lot of students out there looking to travel to your institution. And if they can't travel today, looking to start online and eventually move on campus. So uh, Adam, you can go to the next slide. Um, now connecting to what George mentioned, virtual events, and that was really the reason why I wanted to have this, uh, this event today. The main reason was really virtual events. Then we thought, oh, why not expanding it and, and talking about in general digitalization of education talk about the different associations out there and so on. There's, uh, I think there are three main events, at least these are the events that we tend to run with our students, which have proven being very, very much of interest. So let's start by the simpler one, the one we've been running for five years, which is webinars. Webinars, we've all done webinars. We are in a webinar right now. I think, yes, there is a bit of webinar fatigue out there. We're all very tired of webinars. I think I've had 17 webinars in the last three days. Um, and, uh, and we're all tired, but I think students, that's the one way for students to engage with you today. They don't have other solutions. They cannot travel to your institution. They cannot visit your institution. They cannot even call you sometimes because you guys are not in the office. You're working from home. So how do they reach out to you? By organizing webinars, virtual events. So um, that's basically what we do today. We organize webinars for universities. It's a 45 minute interaction with a 50 minute Q&A at the end. The average, normally we bring 150 to 200 registrations per webinar and 30% of that tends to participate in the event. Virtual open days, that's something quite new. Last year, so we, Adam and I have been on lockdown at home for one year. So we went on lockdown pretty much on Monday next week. Uh, for the first time. I, we haven't been to the office since then. So it's one year. I'm going tomorrow to the office actually for the first time. Um, and a lot of universities have open days planned in March and April. So what we did is that we invented virtual open days. So we started creating open days virtually. Now, a normal open day, what it does is that it attracts only local students. So what we have noticed is that with a virtual open day, you can invite the world. You can have international students from all over the world coming into a virtual environment that we can build for you, we can create for you. It can be a big webinar, it can be a week of webinars, it can be fully recorded, it can be live, it can be a mix of recording and live. There's so many options, there's so many things we can do, it's fully customizable and that's the best part. You can, inter you can invite people from all over the world. We have had virtual open days with over a thousand people connected in one day to one institution listening to a professor talking about uh, Coding is an example. So there are really a lot of opportunities with virtual open days and students are find it also cheaper. They don't need to travel. I'm thinking of a student in uh, in Texas, perhaps, who's interested in studying in New York. Is he going to travel the way to New York? How much is that going to cost him? With a virtual open day, they don't need to travel. They can do it from their, from their computer. They can do it and watch it later. We also can offer contents on demand so you can have it live for the entire year. And it can become a fully recorded virtual open, open year, really. So that's that's fantastic, I think. And the last part is virtual fairs. I know a lot of you have done virtual fairs, have had terrible experiences. That's what I hear, at least from some of our clients. I've participated in some, and I've had awful experiences as a student. I tried to participate to see what they were doing. And uh, I've participated for some of our clients as if I was them, because I was asked to do so. I waited for one seven hours, and one student showed up. So with virtual fairs, it's a little tricky. So I think it's not never going to be the same. It's never going to be a face-to-face -face interaction. But I think, Adam, you can go to the next slide. What we try to do on our virtual fairs, at least, and we're new to it. So we started last year. We launched them for the first time. Is really make it as close as possible to a face-to-face -face interaction. And not an entire day. Because while if a, if a student goes to a QS fair, as an example, in person, what happens is that they walk into the door, they've already invested so much to get to the fair, they're going to stay there. With online, they come in five minutes, they can, be, they can come in 30 seconds and leave. So it can be super, super quick for them 
the experience. So if they don't get in that five, 10 minutes of their, you know, we say that student generation X and Y have attention span of what, five, six seconds. So we need to engage them in those five, six seconds when they walk in. That has to be engaging enough. And I think, for example, the, the platform that George showed are fantastic because they're super engaging. I mean, the 360 one, when I, when I watched, saw it the first time, I was like, wow, that's amazing. I love Google Street View. That basically is what, that's what it is. It's Google Street View of your institution. Um, actually, Google Street View also does uh, uh, your institution if you want. So they can come in and basically do the entire university uh, on Google Street View. So that you can also do. I know some of our clients have done it. The other part is a team effort. So whoever you engage, I think, to run a virtual event for you needs to be fully committed needs to be an extension of your admission team, an extension of your marketing team, an extension of your entire team. They need to be working there for you, with you, to make the event a success. And the last part, which is probably the most important one, is student counseling. So one thing is to say, I'm bringing you students. You know, I'm, I'm bringing you leads. That's fantastic. Great, I'll bring you leads. But what are you going to do with these leads? The follow-up is what matters. So one thing that, for example, we do at Docs is really following up with every single student, engaging them, counseling, finding out exactly what they're looking for, what they're interested in. So I think the counseling part is essential today because students never submit an inquiry just in one place. They submit hundreds. I mean, if I had to look for a university today, I wouldn't just go in one place and say, I'm interested. I would go in as many places as I can. And the challenge today I see with portals, lead providers is that they just generate the inquiry, they generate the lead. And I hate the word lead, I really don't like it. It's not a lead, it should be a student. It should be a student interested. It doesn't have to be an enrollment like an agent does because then the agents will take a cut of it. But a lead I generate, it needs to be a student genuinely interested in the problem. When I call them, I want to, I want to hear, yes, I'm interested. I don't wanna hear, I don't remember submitting an inquiry because that really is the worst part. Uh, from my point of view. And we call every single student that we have. I mean, we are a student community, so we know our students. It's a bit different than a portal. But when I call them, I want to talk to them. I want to engage in them. I want to be their friend. That's the idea. I'm not there to sell them anything. They're not paying anything for us. They're not paying us. They're here to tell us what they're looking for, what their skill set is, what programs they're interested in. And at that point, we are able to engage them and direct them to the right institution, which offers that exact program that they could be interested in. So this is it for my part, Adam, yeah. uh, you can. Uh... Cheers, Andrea, yep, yeah, all good. So guys, now we go on to the rapid fire talks. Um, one of my favorite parts of the event, if not my favorite. And uh, here we are going to have four great speakers from different universities, colleges, schools of businesses across the United States and Canada. So we'll have Alec Knight, first of all, from Colorado Messi University, then a Catherine from Canada College, um, which is part of the San Mateo Colleges of Silicon Valley. Then we'll have Dylan from the Gabelli School of Business, Fordham University, and then Kais from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Canada. So Alec, if we can be begin with you. Um, we have a very broad question, so answer it as you wish. Um, what is the best practice you have implemented in your virtual events and online student recruitment? Awesome. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from and where this whole experience has kind of taken place. So CMU is a mid-sized public university located in Grand Junction, Colorado. We're also um, primarily baccalaureate and vocationally focused. So this means that all of the recruiting we've done in the last year or so has been focused on the undergraduate space. So again, your experience might be a little bit different than ours. The other thing that sets CMU apart from some other schools that you, uh, that you might be representing is that we were committed to in-person instruction for fall 2020 and we're in person for spring currently. So that again, might uh, differentiate us in what we are able to offer. Basically, when it comes to virtual events, we've been entirely operating in that virtual fair space that Andrea talked about, and they, they've all been arranged by different third parties, and because each one has its own approach, and each of them had varying degrees of success. So obviously, communications technology is, is going to be the medium where this is all taking place, uh, especially in the context of a global pandemic. What we found is that the events that most closely mirrored a traditional fair seem to generate the most positive engagement. 
Um, some good things to look for were, again, virtual booths uh, with digitally available recruiting materials, and then a streamlined way to communicate with admissions reps within that specific booth. Uh, and obviously, uh, technology is essential to this entire thing, and it allows us to do a lot of really amazing things. But the biggest thing I'd recommend is a judicious approach to incorporating different technological capabilities. Uh, bells and whistles for an event look great on paper, but in our, our experience, they're not huge contributors to positive engagement. Ultimately, the more streamlined and simple the interface, the better the experience. Um, if you have students who are bouncing around multiple locations within a platform, that decreases the chances of meaningful engagement with any specific piece of that. So another way to say this, the more things you offer, the less engagement with any individual. So if I were to design a virtual event, I would go about this from an education standpoint and design it like a syllabus. Well, what are my learning outcomes? What is the specific purpose of the event? And what does each technological piece do to contribute to that purpose? Uh, another thing that I like to keep in mind when I'm designing something is just because you can doesn't mean you should. So an example of a technological bell and whistle that seems really cool on paper, but that didn't end up doing anything to contribute to the experience was we participated in an event that had essentially a speed dating component where there was a keynote speaker, then there was this speed dating thing, and then there was the virtual fair with students visiting booths. Basically, you would click a button, you'd be randomly paired with a student, and there was a one minute time limit. Uh, first of all, the system itself didn't always work. And when it did, it was borderline impossible to do anything within the time limit or address any questions for the students. So you were scrambling to try to get them to click the share contact information so that you could follow up with them later. And even that didn't work particularly well. That was a perfect example of, yeah, it's cool that we can do this, but what is this adding to the overall equation? So ultimately, yeah, simplicity and ease of navigation should be your primary concern uh, when you're designing an event. Uh, and one thing you might wanna consider doing uh, to simplify an individual event is to have it as a standalone. So if you might have a presentation with a keynote speaker is one event at a specific time, and then have a, an event that is purely for inter interacting with admissions representatives. Uh, again, that, that virtual fair, virtual booth concept, because then you have one event for one thing that a student is engaged with that one thing. So obviously your mileage is gonna vary depending on what events you work with. And again, the institution you represent, but this has really been the few things that I've learned while bouncing between these different uh, recruiting events over the past year. So thank you for your time and I look forward to questions later. Thanks. Thank you, Alec. Very good insights. And now we have Catherine uh, from Kanye de College and San Mateo Colleges of Silicon Valley. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Uh, just a little bit about um, me. I manage the international program at Kenyatta College, which is a community college in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are one of the three uh, San Mateo Colleges in the, the district um, of which uh, Dr. Luan is the provost. So um, in addition to managing the students on campus, I also um, virtually recruit and previously traveled to recruit for all three colleges along with Dr. Luan. So obviously a lot has changed. Um, fortunately, interestingly, our international team before the pandemic had begun creating what's called a global online learning program, which made it easier and allowed any uh, student from abroad to enroll in the classes for credit, uh, which is accepted at over 150 universities in the US. So this program was very helpful to have in place when the pandemic began. And suddenly we went from having a small number of online classes available to 100% of all of our classes available. So that was interesting. And then of course, at the same time, um, we had done some virtual recruitment in the past, but more so definitely in-country recruitment. Um, so last spring, we heavily ramped up our virtual recruitment. Um, we did a combination of participating and organizing our own webinars from among our networks and inviting them, um, plus strategically choosing organizations to partner with uh, for local support and markets. So I would say, having personally participated in many of these, one of our best practices that I would share is including a current student or successful alumni student in the presentation when at all possible. Um, you know, ideally we ask the student to speak live. Sometimes that means them waking up in the middle of the night. Um, if it's not possible for them to speak live, then in the very least, we have a testimonial slide with their comments and their picture. Um, because we found that the prospective students, the agents, the parents, everybody 
wants to hear directly about the campus experience. And this, of course, lends credibility to anything that we would say as staff and administrators. Um, also, it has the added benefit of speaking in the native language. So in our experience, our volunteer students have had have enjoyed doing this. Um, and we've had positive feedback from the webinars and from the participants. And of course, you know, it is important to meet with the student beforehand, brief them, make sure all the technology is working and, uh, you know, make sure they they're understand uh, the event. A um, couple other things to leave you with. Um, we have also found that encouraging our entire team, uh, involving our entire team in virtual recruitment has been important. So we have a shared document with all the events listed for the semester and we invite our whole team to sign up to participate. And this way we can cover many more events. Um, you know, anyone from a program coordinator to an administrator can participate. We try to pair up an administrator with a, a, re with a representative from the college and of course a student. And um, we provide, you know, templates and training in advance to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, finally, on the, on the subject of technology, um, we have adopted on our website a, not a chat bot, but a chat function called Unibuddy, actually, that organizes student comments and students who are hitting the web page, organizes and distributes them among student ambassadors or student buddies, as they call them, and uh, as well as staff. And so this also has been some technology that we've um, included on our website. So yes, definitely involving a student voice has been very important for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so next uh, we have Dylan from the Gabelli School of Business and Fordham University. Thank you, Adam. Hello, everyone. Um, as Adam said, my name is Dylan Mosenthal. I serve as the Associate Director of MBA Admissions at uh, Fordham University right in New York City. So uh, I can attest to what George said about uh, rent expense in New York. It is uh, not, a, not, a, <laughs> not a cheap city. Uh, to, to live in, and, and we've you know certainly have seen um, the effects of you know going to a hybrid approach. How that's actually helped people uh, deposit because they know they don't have to pay the the outrageous rent. Um, you know, I, I I come from a different perspective than than my colleagues. Uh, obviously, graduate school and specifically an MBA program. Um, but uh, I'm going to take a couple of the the points that Catherine made because I think they're they're spot on. I think one of the benefits, unintended benefits of uh, having, um, you know, this virtual world, uh, you know, come out of nowhere where everyone had to adapt to Zoom settings and, and you know, having these platforms to speak to people virtually. Um, we've been able to get current students and I would also add alumni involved in a lot of our efforts. And I think in the past, that wasn't possible for in-person events. Um, you know, it was like pulling teeth if we were traveling to get a local alum to come to a fair. Uh, but now all they have to do is, you know, click a button and, and you know, they're participating in a panel. And I would say that the same goes for, for current students. So um, really across the, the portfolio of our webinars, our, our live Q&As and things like that, we are having the students speak. We are having the alumni speak, the people who actually, you know, put their money where their mouth is and, and invested in the experience. So, um, you know, I would say that's the number one thing that, that we changed. Um, and that's really helped our, our virtual engagement. Thank you very much, Dylan. I really appreciate that. And then last but not least, again, uh, we have uh, Kais from Canada, from Kantlin Polytechnic University. Yeah, Adam, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for the invitation again. Uh, last on the list, last but not least. Uh, thank you for, for joining us today. So similar to what uh, Dylan was mentioning with, with New York City in Vancouver, we have that challenge of, of high cost of, of friends and the hybrid version in a way, or the online studies have helped a little bit uh, our students in, in that sense. But in terms of uh, digital recruitment um, at KPU, it was incorporated in two phases. The first one was through the optimization of our recruitment resources and admission policies. Um, for recruitment, we have just moved meetings with prospective students online and increased the frequency from two to four hours, four days a week. Um, when in terms of admissions, we start accepting digital copies of transcripts and language tests that are conducted online when everything was paper-based in the past. Um, with those internal changes, we had to inform our partners accordingly. And of course, those updates were, were provided through virtual meetings and webinars. The second phase of the uh, incorporation uh, of, and was the exploration of those new resources. And at KPU, we focused on three 
which are first uh, e-branding. It has been done through platforms such as DocCity, and we saw an increase from interest uh, uh, from European students and uh, Latin Americans in the past year. The second one is uh, virtual fairs, and our focus was Edu Canada, since those events uh, are attended uh, by students and prospects that are interested in Canadian universities. And that was efficient, of course, to reach the maximum number of countries in, in one event. Uh, last but not least, social media management, uh, where we have created KPU account, accounts sorry, for platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. And it was done in different languages to target different countries. Uh, those pages are professionally managed by SMM companies, so social media management companies. And it was a solution for prospects to explore what the university uh, can offer. Um, ultimately, we believe that the future will be hybrid as both virtual and in-person recruitment uh, are complementary in, in a way. So uh, again, uh, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity today. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, it, it was an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. Um, well, look, that... That's uh, the end of our rapid fire talks. Now we have a lot of questions in chat. Um, George, perhaps if you um, know to answer any of them, that would be great. I will just make a comment of my own just while we're here. So uh, Andre and I, um, we do virtual events and we've noticed uh, every time before we do a virtual event, you email the people. We WhatsApp them four times if necessary on the day of the event, the day before the event, a week before the event. And uh, also you call them if necessary. And what happens is, let's say you have uh, 100 people registered, well, 200 people registered, you could go from 10%, 5% of people actually attending to 30, 40%, sometimes even 70 or 80%. Um, so that, that's a very, very good thing, WhatsApp. And even this event we've done today, we didn't want to do WhatsApp, but the emails we sent today, the reminder emails with the Zoom link, we did two of them. I'm sure it's helped to actually get people there.